Tonight, the powerful storm slamming the west coast as we come on the air. Another dangerous system fueled by an atmospheric river pounding California on top of ground already saturated by wet winter weather. The image is coming in, mudslides and flooding, cars trapped, roads cracked, palm trees falling into the ocean. We're tracking it all. Also tonight, the widow of Alexei Navalny speaking out, accusing Vladimir Putin of killing her husband and vowing to continue his fight. And the questions, where is Novani's body? Former President Trump breaking his silence about Novani's death, but no mention of Russia or Putin. Days after two people were fatally shot inside a dorm at a Colorado university, there's word tonight of an arrest. The search for answers after two police officers and a firefighter were killed in a shootout at a Minnesota home. What we're learning about the shooter, was he banned from owning guns? The video from Iran-backed Houthis claiming to show a missile launching and then wreckage of a U.S. drone. As the war in Ukraine nears the two-year mark, the fears that a nuclear power plant is on the brink of disaster. Our Richard Engel is there. And having a renaissance, Al Roker on the amazing new exhibit honoring an extraordinary era in black history. This is NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good evening, everyone. After weeks of rain saturating the ground and flooding vulnerable communities, relief is hardly in sight tonight for the West Coast. Yet another storm bearing down on California with heavy rain and threatening to bring more flooding to areas where the ground is already thoroughly soaked. Nearly 35 million people, almost the state's entire population, under flood watches tonight in Southern California. Multiple reports of flooding and mudslides. A car trapped in Santa Barbara County pulled out of the floodwaters. The normally busy 101 freeway through Ventura shut down. And in Northern California, the storm triggering mudslides in wine country, a tree no match for the storm blocking a road. Tonight, we're trekking the threat and Liz Kreutz starts us off from the storm zone. Tonight, another powerful storm pummeling California. Whoa. Up and down the coast, 35 million people under flood watches. The deluge leading to dangerous driving conditions, spin outs, and overturned cars. At least four mudslides reported in Los Angeles. While near Sacramento, drivers like this man getting stuck, thinking he could get through this rushing water. Similar rescues near Santa Barbara. During these storms, people often seem to underestimate the power of water. They absolutely do. Water can kill. And so be very, very cognizant of rushing water, especially in vehicles. The airport there once again canceling all flights, leaving travelers scrambling. They said the airport is closed for the day. It's flooding. In Ventura County, portions of Highway 101 also flooded. Traffic backed up on the major interstate as crews worked to pump water off the roadway. And just north, much of Refugio State Park underwater and now closed to the public after these once majestic palm trees came crashing down. There are several of these massive trees here that have been completely uprooted, collapsed into the ocean. And with the soil even more saturated, officials say these trees they've marked in blue could also go down at any time. This all comes after the deadly atmospheric rivers that pounded California two weeks ago. The series of back-to-back -back storms taking a toll on the state's infrastructure. Overnight, heavy rain causing this mudslide in Northern California, fallen trees blocking the road below. This relentless rain leaving behind yet another mess in this already saturated state. Liz, any idea when conditions will ease up a bit? Yeah, well, Lester, conditions do seem to be improving here. It's still raining, though, and showers are expected through tomorrow. And we're still feeling the impacts of this storm from mudslides to the high surf advisory here on the coast. Millions also remain under those flood watches. And Lester, in central California, there's a possibility for a tornado later tonight. Lester. All right, Liz Kreutz, thank you. Another major story we're following the fallout from the death of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny. Navalny's widow today blaming Vladimir Putin, and it comes as former President Trump breaks his silence about Navalny's death. Here's Garrett Haig. The death of Russian President Vladimir Putin's most prominent critic, sparking protests around the world. Three years ago, President Biden warned Putin of devastating consequences if Alexei Navalny died in Russian custody. Tonight, Mr. Biden says he's weighing new sanctions. We already have sanctions moving and we're considering additional sanctions, yes. 
Russian officials say Navalny died in prison while going for a walk. His wife, Yulia, today said he was poisoned, and Russia is refusing to hand over his body. Three days ago, Vladimir, Putin... Vladimir Putin killed my husband, she says. I will continue to fight for my country. I encourage you to stand by my side. Tonight, Republican frontrunner Donald Trump's first comment on Navalny, making no mention of Putin or Russia, writing, the sudden death of Alexei Navalny has made me more and more aware of what is happening in our country. Nikki Haley slamming that comment and Trump's recent remarks that he would encourage Russia to attack NATO allies unwilling to meet defense spending goals. He sided with a dictator who kills his political opponents. The Biden campaign also looking to exploit those comments. Every president since Truman has been a rock solid supporter of NATO. Targeting this digital ad to the 900,000 Michigan voters with roots in NATO border states. Voters like Andy Ladek, a U.S. Army veteran who immigrated from Poland as a child and finds the remarks disqualifying for a would-be commander-in-chief. For someone like the, a former president of the United States uh, to say something like that is, is beyond the pale. Um, it, it's just totally unacceptable. But President Biden faces an uphill battle here in Michigan, where polls show Mr. Trump in a strong position. And Garrett, President Biden also faces a new hurdle in Michigan related to next week's Democratic primary. What can you tell us? That's right, Lester. A movement among the state's sizable Arab American population, including progressive Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib, to vote uncommitted in that primary as a protest vote against the Biden administration, support for Israel and their actions in Gaza. It could be a major warning sign for November. Lester. Garrett Haig, thank you. Now to the Middle East and the dramatic new video from the Iran-backed Houthi militia who claim it shows them shooting down a U.S. drone in Yemen. Courtney Cuby is at the Pentagon. Courtney, what are U.S. military officials saying about this? Well, Lester, U.S. officials say the military is investigating why that U.S. Reaper drone crashed. Now, this is the video put out by the Houthis showing flashes of light in the night sky, then drone wreckage washing up along the beach. The Iranian-backed militia claim they shot it down. But this comes after one of the most serious Houthi attacks to date, a Houthi missile striking a British-owned commercial ship, forcing the crew to abandon the vessel. And two American-owned commercial ships were also targeted today, one suffering minor damage. The U.S. military has launched multiple attacks against Houthi targets in Yemen, including more today. But it's clear these strikes are not stopping these Houthi attacks. Lester. All right. Courtney Cuby with that tonight. Thank you. In Colorado, a suspect is under arrest for a fatal double shooting at a college. Nicholas Jordan, a 25-year-old student at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, was arrested today. On Friday, two people were found dead inside a dorm on campus. Police said the suspect was known to the victims and that this was not a random attack. In Minnesota, police are searching for answers after three first responders were killed in the line of duty. And tonight, we're learning more about the shooter who was banned from having guns. Adrian Broadus is there for us tonight. Outside the Burnsville, Minnesota police station, balloons, flowers, and embraces as this community mourns the three first responders killed early Sunday. They put their lives on the line every day for us. Everybody is hurting right now. Police officers Paul Elmstrand, Matthew Ruge, both 27, and 40-year-old firefighter paramedic Adam Finseth were shot while responding to a domestic violence incident. We are all hurting. We're heartbroken. We are heartbroken. Tonight, the county medical examiner confirming the man responsible for their deaths is 38-year-old Shannon Cortez Gooden. Police say it began at 1.50 Sunday morning with the 911 call reporting a man was armed and barricaded inside a home. Officers arrived and began negotiating with him, later learning there were seven children inside, ages 2 to 15. Around 5 a.m., neighbors say they heard shots. Police say the gunman fired from both floors of the home. Medics, please back off. Medics, back off and turn off lights. By 8 a.m., the shooter was dead. Others inside were able to get out safely. Court documents show Gooden was prohibited from possessing firearms following a 2008 conviction. In 2020, he petitioned to have his access to guns restored. That was denied. Tonight, Burnsville remembering Elmstrand, a six-and-a-half-year veteran of the department, Rugi, who was part of the crisis negotiation team, and Finseth, a SWAT paramedic. Every day we pray that they go home to their families, and today that's not happening. 
And tonight, another officer who was injured in the shooting is out of the hospital, home, and expected to make a full recovery. Lester. Adrian brought us. Thank you. Now to Ukraine. As we approach two years since Russia invaded, there are growing concerns that the largest nuclear power plant in Europe, in southeastern Ukraine, may be on the brink of disaster. Richard Engel is there. It's midnight on March 4th, 2022. CCTV cameras capture Russian troops as they attack Europe's biggest nuclear power plant near the Ukrainian city of Zaporizhia. It should be night. Pietro Kotin, the CEO of Ukraine's nuclear power company, watched the attack it's from Kyiv. This is just a terrifying video, yeah, watching exactly. fire spread and an attack at an active nuclear facility. Right. And the units are with nuclear materials right here. The Ukrainians broadcast warnings, telling Russian troops to stop shelling at the risk of a nuclear disaster. The warnings went unheeded. Russian troops occupied the plant and the territory around it. Ukrainian forces held on to the far bank of the Dnieper River, leaving the nuclear power station right on the front line. Two years on, the International Atomic Energy Agency, which has inspectors at the plant, is sounding the alarm. You're responsible for nuclear security all around the world. Yes. Is this the most dangerous nuclear facility on the planet right now? It's the most dangerous situation that we have. It's my job not to, uh, you know, so panic, but at the same time, I have to tell the truth of what is happening. Nuclear experts point to three main dangers. First, a military strike on the plant, either accidental or deliberate. Second, a power cut. The plant's six uranium reactors require electricity for cooling. But Ukrainian officials say three of the four power lines are damaged, and the fourth is faulty. There have already been eight blackouts, as recently as December. When you have a blackout, the cooling function of the reactors is lost, and you could have a, a meltdown. And finally, it's understaffed. Ukrainians say the Russians have been abusing employees. 11,000 people worked at the plant before. Only 4,000 work there now. Irina Kokot is responsible for radiation detection for the Ukrainian government. Her office predicts how, if there was a meltdown, a cloud of radioactive particles would spread across much of Ukraine and Istanbul. neighboring countries. Yes. This is Istanbul, right here, yes. the city of Istanbul. Yeah, this is Istanbul. Uh, Contaminated uh, the entire city of Istanbul on the Black Sea. It's yes. a catastrophe, a total catastrophe. She says the fallout would last up to 100 years. A nuclear disaster here would be felt around the world and leave large parts of Ukraine and beyond uninhabitable. Lester. Incredibly disturbing. Richard, thank you. In just 60 seconds, a search for a missing 11-year-old girl who never made it on the school bus. A man in custody, but where is she? We're back with an urgent search in Polk County, Texas, for a missing 11-year-old girl who disappeared four days ago after she never made it to school. Audrey Cunningham was last seen near her home. Officials say a person of interest was arrested on an unrelated charge on Friday, but that his SUV might have been involved in her disappearance. Also developing the Biden administration possibly tapping the brakes on plans for automakers to cut back on car emissions. Tom Costello has details. From the gas pump to the charging station, America's green shift accelerated to a record 1.2 million new electric vehicle sales last year. The average price, $50,789. But the rate of growth is slowing as unsold EVs stack up at dealerships. In Wisconsin, Coons Automotive owns 44 dealerships across the region. Yeah, we've definitely seen a slowdown across the board on EV sales. Cutting tailpipe emissions has been a key driver of President Biden's climate change agenda. We're building the future of the electric vehicle. We're bringing back U.S. manufacturing jobs. But the Biden EPA is now set to slow the ramp up of tough new emission rules. That could mean two thirds of all new vehicle sales would be electric by 2032. The $40,000 vehicle, the $35,000 vehicle, the choices are limited 
in the mass market when it comes to electric vehicles. Pressure to slow the pace of the new standards rollout comes from automakers which have invested heavily in new battery technology and auto workers who fear potential job cuts. In September, Mr. Biden walked the picket line with UAW workers. Last month, the union endorsed him for another term. But after the hottest year on record, environmental advocates warn slowing the emissions target rollout will have a cost. More oil use, more pollution, more global warming, and more kids with asthma. So that's a bad deal. And Tom, a final decision expected this spring. That's right. Late May or early uh, April, late March, early April. Exactly how automakers achieve those emission standards, though, through a mix of EVs, hybrids, regular gas vehicles, that will be up to them, Lester. All right, Tom, thank you. Up next, a warning about climate change and why it has this winter tradition on ice. We're back now with our climate challenge series and a closer look at how warmer temperatures are threatening winter traditions. Here's Jesse Kirsch. This sound out here is bad news. No, it should be more firm. On Minnesota's frozen Millax Lake, we measure about 13 inches of ice. In a normal February, there should be more than two feet. And normally you'd have snow on top of it and it'd be all solid, good, clear ice. But thanks to an unseasonably warm winter, a lake that should be covered in ice fishing villages is a ghost town. What has this season been like? It's been pretty non-existent. When we visited earlier this month, Linda Eno's Twin Pines Resort should have been buzzing with hundreds of ice fishers. But this year, about the only thing feeling the chill is her business. My bartender, my cooks, you know, the hours, my waitresses, it just, they are truly the victims of this. So you can't, you just company. don't have as much work for them? No, I have practically zero work. Beyond slumping sails, late and thin ice can mean more rescues across the country. I got you. Keep your hands there on your belly. Even for wildlife. Minnesota is known as the land of 10,000 lakes, and every one of them is supposed to freeze over like this in the winter. But the state says that climate change is taking its toll. Over the last 50 years or so, the lake ice season here has shrunk by up to two weeks. This season, especially bizarre and frustrating for Michael Lankowski, who's been ice fishing since age four. The fish have been biting like crazy, and there's nobody fishing. He tries to come out every day. Well, I sit in my house fixing gear and just waiting to come. He's one of the people not scared away by warm weather. What does that mean to you? I'm very thankful for every single person that walks through my door. Very thankful. As our ever-changing world puts winter fun at risk of literally melting away. Jesse Kirsch, NBC News, Mill Lacks Lake, Minnesota. And when we come back here tonight, history like you've never seen it before and the renaissance that inspired it a century ago. Finally tonight, a groundbreaking look at the art and culture boom, one historic New York City neighborhood at the center of it all. Here's Al Roker. A few miles from its namesake neighborhood, New York City's first showcase in 40 years of the black artistic expression that flourished between the 1920s and 1940s. It was written out of history, and I think our goal now is to write it back into history. Denise Morell is the curator of the Metropolitan Museum of Art's newest exhibition, The Harlem Renaissance and Transatlantic Modernism. Twelve galleries of portraits, photographs, paintings, and sculptures portraying scenes of activism and everyday life. Wow, all that history in one... Astounding and, and really, really moving. An exploration of how the Great Migration and exodus of African Americans from the segregated South to cities in the North, like New York and Chicago, led to an explosion of creativity in art, literature, and music. You had a fully developed black community involved in all aspects of social life in a way that just would not have been possible in a, a situation where, due to legal segregation, there couldn't even be public gatherings no. beyond a certain point. Morell's multi-year treasure hunt, often outside traditional art museums, brought some of the 160 artworks here. Many culled from the collections of historically black colleges and universities, like Archibald Motley's Lady in Blue. Just a sense of economic, cultural, 
and social, uh, self-determination, mm -hmm. self-expression. That is part of what the Harlem Renaissance was about. One highlight. Aaron Douglas's mural. We see workers in the field. Some are jubilant. Uh, we have musicians and dancers mm -hmm. celebrating. But the future is foretold as well. We see the Union troops mm -hmm. retreating. This is one of almost a dozen pieces on loan from Harlem's Schomburg Center. These artworks at the nexus of black people recreating themselves. Art that tells a story, a statement of newfound freedom. This is a legacy that I hope generations of today will uh, be inspired by. A restoration of history, bringing it back to the center of American art. Al Roker, NBC News, New York. And Al is going to have much more from that exhibit tomorrow on Today. That's nightly news for this Monday. I'm Lester Holt. Please take care of yourself and each other. Good night. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.